This is something we need to wake up to because the vulnerability is asymmetric. Democracies to operate need some common currency of truth. Autocracies don't. Absolutely to the contrary. Uh, autocratic governments need to be able to control and propagate their version of the truth. So any technology that allows you to muddy facts and undermine data and undermine truth nets out as bad for us and essentially good for them. Now those technologies are all around us. It's a huge force for good potentially, but in this area we've got a problem. Welcome to NatSec Tech from the Special Competitive Studies Project. I'm Jean Meserve. Technology is now a key part of geopolitics. Nations are competing for technological dominance, and they are using technology in new ways to gain the upper hand on enemies and competitors. With me here today to discuss this is Sir Alex Younger. He served for six years as chief of the British secret intelligence service known as MI6. He is now a frequent public speaker and media commentator, and we are thrilled to have you with us here today. Oh, it's great to be here. So thanks for coming in. You have said that the democratic world is, quote, under the full press of Chinese espionage. What do you mean? What has changed? Well, I think that um, the issue for me is the way that espionage is defined. People think of spies like me doing secret stuff in ways that they've seen in the movies. And there's a temptation in those terms, understandable, to think it's something off to the side that doesn't affect them directly. And as democracies, we do, we seek to constrain and channel those activities in a way that's accountable in law and proportionate. Autocracies don't do it like that. In some ways, their security states, Vladimir Putin was a KGB officer, he defines everything that he does in terms of security. And Xi Jinping now, uh, security is coming first and control in every aspect and every piece of decision that he makes. The lesson that she drew from the Cultural Revolution, which he was personally very affected by, was that the people cannot be trusted. And of course, he extends that principle more widely. So it's not in a box in an authoritarian regime. It's full court press. People talk about the hybrid war. It's broadly speaking a Russian invention where you link all aspects of national power to security objectives. Now, as the modern world evol evolves and we get hyper-connectivity, everything is connected to everything else that is weaponized against us. So the biggest asymmetry between us and China is that we don't think there's a conflict going on and they understand very well that there is across the spectrum. And that it therefore involves using information, using technology, using um, economic coercion, as well as military force or all the traditional levers. There's no need to panic, but we need to understand that they're playing one game and we're playing a different one. Have we not understood that? Manifestly not. Um, if you take, for instance, the way in which our governments are organized or our legal systems are organized, we still distinguish under law between peace and war or domestic and international or covert and real. And the genius of a gray zone hybrid approach is that you don't do that you connect everything up. And our unwillingness to do that is a source of weakness. So the source of strength that we have to present is partnership, cross boundaries. The biggest success that I had as an intelligence chief was not to compound our power within the barbed wire as intelligence services, but to promote partnership as between us and other pieces of government, private and public and internationally and start to get across those boundaries and present a united front in the face of these problems. So that's a work in progress. So yeah. in the meantime, are the Chinese eating our lunch? Well, our lunch has been eaten in one pretty important way, which is that um, China launched um, over many years a concerted uh, program to steal our IP, our trade secrets, in order to galvanize its ambition and might I say, Western companies left the door open yeah, to let and, them and, do and that. Frankly, it wasn't hard. And in fact, even worse, Gene, half the time we did it knowingly by entering into research partnerships or just putting stuff out there in scientific conferences. Now, I understand that the reason we're all rich is because of scientists' willingness to share ideas. Knowledge should be open. It drives all of the progress we've seen. But nor should we be naive. What's moving in China, uh, with, and this is important, is, is that the intelligence ambitions now go beyond stealing IP. They're now avowedly political. And Xi Jinping 
I think, correctly understands that the security of the Communist Party rests on his ability to dominate any idea, dominate and eliminate any idea of democracy, particularly in his near abroad as a viable alternative to socialism with Chinese characteristics. So now we've gone into something more difficult, which is essentially um, uh, organs of the Chinese Communist Party trying to influence the way that you and I think about stuff. And that's a problem. And one of the ways they're doing that, of course, is through disinformation. Um, yes. And not... So long ago, um, there were stories allegedly planted by China about the wildfires in Maui and that the Chinese even provided AI-generated images mm -hmm. to bolster this disinformation mm -hmm. campaign. Is that just the tip of the iceberg? Yeah, this is, this is something we need to wake up to because the vulnerability is asymmetric. Democracies to operate need some common currency of truth. Now that truth is contested, of course, that's what, what democracies do. But fundamentally, there need to be facts at the bottom of the argument. If that goes, we're in a weak position. Autocracies don't, absolutely to the contrary. Uh, autocratic governments need to be able to control and propagate their version of the truth. So any technology that allows you to muddy facts and undermine data and undermine truth nets out as bad for us and essentially good for them. Now, those technologies are all around us. And when you look at the, particularly the advent of, of generative AI and the way in which it can, can be combined with other technologies, it's a huge force for good, potentially. But in this area, we've got a problem. So this is a big election year, not just in the US, but EU, India, all around the world. Do you expect they're going to turbocharge their disinformation campaigns to have an impact on those elections? Uh, look, I do. It's what I would be doing if I were in their position. But can I say something um, which might perhaps surprise you coming from a spy, which is fundamentally the problem is not hostile states. Explain. And, by, and indeed, the biggest damage we could do in this very febrile time is to imagine that the divisions that exist within our democracy were created by China or Russia. They weren't. They were created by us. And the crucial point there is that we do have it in our power to change it. The great problem with putting it all on Russia and China is that we, we um, then feel we don't have responsibility to act. So that's lecture over. One level down, absolutely. And we need to get serious about this and, um, and engage across the piece, my old services, of course, but more broadly in making sure that in this year, this most political of years, 2024, no one's allowed to swing the result with, with um, false information. Uh -huh noble goal, but can it be done? I think that um, uh, there are plenty of ways in which that can be achieved. Now, you, 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 it's frustrating for you, Jean, because you can tell I have a philosophical bent. <laughs> we do have <laughs> not a, at all frustrating. <laughs> we do have a problem, which is that you, um, in Western societies, it's not up to the government to say what's true, okay? So we need to think hard about trusted sources of information for the public. We need to think about education. We need to think well, about we've been technology hearing solutions. those same themes since the last presidential election in the US, mm. at least. Mm. And yet, we still have this enormous problem. But you and I are talking about it now, so it must be serious. But talking about it isn't going to solve the problem. No. Well, it is to some degree. There, there has to be something in the public consciousness that takes this from the esoteric to the close and present danger. I think a key tipping point for me, and I do take your point, it's a serious point, key tipping point for me is where tech understand that the future of their industry rests on their willingness to um, enact capabilities that make this stuff less likely. Fundamentally, this is about partnership. Now, good news, I'm not, I don't want to be utopian about it. It's not my job. But I do see, over my time in office, a significantly improved readiness on the part of tech to work with people like us, government, from the sort of ground zero of, it, of Edward Snowden times. It is totally different now. But they have cut back many of the big tech companies on their efforts to detect disinformation and to eliminate disinformation. Isn't that bad news? It is, of course, bad news. And it goes well beyond the issue of, um, of elections. There's, there's child safety and fraud and many other things to consider. And their feet need to be held to, part, to the fire. Um, the UK this month has passed the Online Safety Act, which I think does what uh, something that, in my mind, is overdue, which is to make tech companies legally responsible for the way in which their products 
are used. But actually, we need a strategic solution to this. So detection is always going to be hampered by considerations of scale. We need technology solutions that actually allow you to resolve the provenance of information online. That's where the big brain should be going. And there's been a really fascinating presentation on that today at the SCSP, which certainly cheered me up. Well, talking about the provenance, so okay, if you can figure out that it originated in Russia or mm. China or mm. Iran or North Korea, fine. But as you mentioned, this is a problem that our societies have created, mm. and it does emanate from inside our countries. And then it comes down to, in the United States, a discussion of First Amendment rights. And I may regard something um, as being counterfactual, but someone else and their perception may believe differently. Yeah. So um, maybe you shouldn't have a constitution. We haven't got one. <laughs> well, well then, then Xi Jinping really <laughs> had a change oh, no, his fine. <laughs> no, I'm being facetious, and, um, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but clearly people have got to be willing participants in that. There has to be an appetite to discern truth from fiction. Um, and then there's a, a, an education, I think, lies at the heart of that. Um, and then we circle back to what I said at the beginning. We have a very, very polarized um, electorate. Very, our countries are very polarized. Um, uh, there's little confidence in democracy or less than there used to be. And here's the irony. That's largely the result of all of these amazing technologies that have made us rich. So this is an, it loops back again to the responsibility on the part of the creators of these um, uh, technologies alongside governments to work to mitigate the, the social harms. Social media is an excellent example of that, optimized to heighten polarization as a matter of commercial gain. <laughs> it's unacceptable. Another persistent problem, cyber attacks. How do we prevent this tsunami <laughs> from completely engulfing us? I think that um, I, it, it, this is a thing I worry about. Um, it, to be honest, it's not so much kind of cyber catastrophes as just the drip, drip, drip of damage that's done every day by fraudsters or hostile governments or ransomware operators. Because it's not seen, we don't understand the damage. And crucially, because it's invisible also, we don't understand the risk and we don't invest properly in dealing with it. So I think it is a big problem. Dealing with it, um, I, I, I would go down two axes. One, it's, I think, the responsibility of leaders of any organization to understand that most of the vulnerabilities exploited by malign actors in cyberspace are human. They are not technical. And if you think this is a technology problem, you're wrong. It's a human problem. Take it from me. I've seen this, you know, from all sides. Um, so that, um, that's got to stop. And then, uh, and then AI. Big question. Whose side is AI on here? <laughs> There's a really dystopian possibility of, um, of intelligent malware that mutates as it goes through systems, making it impossible to categorize and build, um, build defenses against. Equally, in AI, we could have um, uh, organize, uh, um, systems that patch in real time. <laughs> I need to know the answer about who AI eyes side is on in this and I think government should be pressurizing people to make sure that it's on ours. That's quite a frightening prospect. Yes. And what does it do when it comes down to attribution? Well, it, if, does it make if, if it you even have, more complicated? Yeah, if you have a shape-shifting um, shape malware then you, you um, uh, it becomes harder to attribute and, and that's a problem because a big part conventionally of the solution in cybersecurity space is partnership where we're all prepared to share quickly how or why and what with we've been attacked in order for everyone else to be able to protect themselves. And, um, and indeed, there's a lot of good sort of US legislation come down the track to try to make that happen. So this is an issue. Hmm. Um, so the West is in an innovation race with China. Mm -hmm. What's at stake here? Um, this is one of the reasons that I enjoy um, being associated with the SCSP. They have called this out. It's fundamental. Along, when you look at um, the, the choices that will be available to my kids alongside climate change, who wins this is the other key determinant of their future. I, I put it no lower than that. If uh, China has worked this out, um, they know, they understand that the, his, the, the century of humiliation that they endure was fundamentally because they turned their back on emerging technology, and they're not going to do it again. And they've told us this, they aspire to dominate 
all the key emerging technologies. Now, to the extent that they're doing that to augment the condition of people in China and to improve their situation, fine. That is one of the reasons, fine. They're also doing it to consolidate the um, their capacity to control their population so that the Communist Party stays in power and to create a dependency on the part of the rest of the world on China's goods and products and a, an imperative to participate in the Chinese version of the internet, which is where truth is dictated by the Communist Party. Now, at that point, a number of things stop existing. Privacy for us stops existing. <laughs> Security stops existing. <laughs> Military dominance stops existing, and ultimately economic power ebbs away. So I don't want to be um, uh, swivel-eyed about this, but people need to understand the stakes. I can assure you that the Communist Party of China has absolutely worked it out. So here in the U.S., um, there have been restrictions imposed on certain semiconductors. Some of our allies mm. have joined that effort. Is that a good first step? Is that kind of the kind of approach the West should be taking to try and maintain the upper hand or gain the upper hand in this competition? Well, I think it's good news and bad news with this stuff. So, um, you know, notoriously, the Washington consensus leaves everything to the market. The UK and the US were the last country standing that everyone else however, had decided that they needed an industrial policy, which involved um, a much more active government in this space to capture some of the externalities. China's built on that, you know, it is an industrial policy. European Union is, is not backward when it comes to it either. Um, that uh, has underlined, uh, undermined a lot of our, our strength and power, uh, particularly in the Anglosphere. And um, I think it's overdue that governments have recognized they've got a much more active role to pay. It was essentially US military investments, investment that bought us the internet or the space industry. Uh, governments have to get back in into the business because China has been doing that for years. So essentially, with reluctance, because it's quite economically inefficient, I think it's good. The bad news is that I think um, in the US in doing this, and I admire the US and I admire the policy, they've been uh, extraordinarily casual about the power of alliances and, and how it feels when you're outside the US but not, a, not an autocrat is that um, this stuff's being done at our expense. Now, it's, um, of course, hypocritical for the European Union, which is also a pretty protectionist organization to complain about this. But let's just grow up. If you've got self-cancelling industrial policies across an alliance that together aspires to withstand the onslaught of, authoritari of authoritarianism, this is not a good look. And I think we need rapidly to re-engineer the concept of being more than the sum of our parts into these types of policies. Are those efforts underway now? Uh, to some extent. I think uh, the administration has got it. I also, to be fair to be fair, the administration, understand the link between these policies and domestic politics. The US unaccountably decided to withdraw from key trade relationships in the Indo-Pacific, and yet it talks about containing China. Well, if you're if you're a neighbor of China and you're being offered a good economic relationship with Beijing and the US has just folded its arms, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> now I think those messages have got through. But it's undeniable that the domestic political discourse around trade openness, for instance, is challenging. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. People's um, trust in government and the identity they get from employment and a whole lot of other stuff is at a low, in part because of all the technologies we've been discussing. So you've written that good policy towards China will simultaneously confront, compete, and cooperate. Yes. Explain what you mean. So we uh, we, we have moral panics about this. Um, I, I believe um, one of the biggest problems we have in the West is we under we forget how strong we are. <laughs> Um, and we get, right, let's decouple. Let's not talk to China ever again. You know, oh, you've gone to China, you politician, you're a traitor. What a load of rubbish. <laughs> I looked at the balloon thing going over the US. I just despaired, you know. Everyone went completely mental. <laughs> Fox News on 24 hours a day. Could JFK have solved the Cuban Missile Crisis under those circumstances? No. The quality of dialogue is at an all-time low. Now, it will be clear from our conversation that I'm not a great fan of authoritarian regimes. And when they muck up, when they seek to undermine our systems, we should go back super hard. And that's what people like me are for. It, it should also be clear, I hope, that I think that the vital ground of this is a competition around emerging technology. And we shouldn't be wet about that. 
But can we also understand that there is one planet which we share with all of these people? <laughs> there are some things that can only be solved at a global level. Can we also understand that a lot of the trade that has built up as between these blocks is highly beneficial to both countries, uh, of both value systems, and has made us richer? And fundamentally, can we also understand that even in the Cold War, we have protocols for dialogue and understandings and treaties, which meant that catastrophic misunderstanding was less likely. So, you know, take this from a, a, a hardline securocrat. This idea that we shouldn't be talking to countries that don't share our values, I think it's nuts. So, that Sorry, put a that fine clear? point that, on it. That <laughs> I think enough? that was clear. I think, I think that came through. Um, so, I have to talk about spying, because oh. that's what you were and did for your career. How has technology changed the business of spying? I mean, you've mentioned how China is using new, new yeah. technologies, but bring it down to so the uh, nitty gritty so, so, level. So the fundamentally and not a lot is the answer. Um, so uh, my, uh, I'm speaking specifically as a human intelligence yes. operator. You know, there's an idea that we're put out of business by all this stuff. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our uh, job uh, is and will always be creating relationships of trust with people across forbidding and cultural boundaries in order to generate the information and actions that keep our people and our allies safe. And the key, the th key to get in your head around is that we've just got to learn to do that in a totally different environment. But my time as chief of MI6, the reason I was given the job was to enact that transformation, make everyone understand the rules of change, make everybody understand that um, some capabilities that only we had 10 years ago are now available you know, at a small price to anybody. These um, things that, that we thought were ours um, now belong to um, small or non-state actors and can do us immense damage. So it's, a, it's been a mindset thing. In truth, for me, it wasn't very hard to get the memo. I began spying in the 90s. You know, I could go anywhere in the world with a bunch of cash and do anything I liked. Google search killed that dead. Then I was head of um, counterterrorism. I did spend 10 years in counterterrorism. What was the answer to stopping bombs going off? It was data and our willingness to share it. And then I was head of operations and I was chief and I saw this new domain open up, cyber. <laughs> so uh, it, it kind of wasn't difficult to see the way in which uh, we were evolving. The trick was to remember in some ways we're not going to change. What are our values? What's this about? It's about relationships. In every other way, fundamentally, it's altered. I was talking to someone else in your business who said it's now virtually impossible to go dark. Yeah. We have a very um, uh, un uncatchy uh, expression which we talk about. We talk about the ubiquitously sensed world. Yes. And that is what we faced. And it's a very uncomfortable place for a person like me to live in. Um, but without going into any detail, <laughs> I can assure you that there are dents in the ubiquitously sensed world that we can So operate when in. we're talking about the ubiquitously... You, <laughs> yeah, you see what I mean? That's too big a word. <laughs> ubiquitous <laughs> sense world. We're talking about, for instance, our phones, which are shedding yeah. information all the time about where we are and what we're mm. doing, right? You're talking about standing in the middle of the Gobi Desert and not being invisible. I mean, it's, it is ubiquitous. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot in here. We don't, we don't have time for this. There, there's a lot of bad news in here for the autocrats as well. So let's not beat ourselves up too much. So <laughs> These technologies don't work great for people who want to dominate every aspect of their citizens' life as well. But they will if we if we if we don't get active. So it, could you expand on that a little bit more? How do they work against the autocrats? Yeah. So I mean, obviously, if you if you take the grief cycle, we started off thinking the internet was on our side, fine, you know, because it literally democratizes information. Turns out actually it's probably on the dictator's side because it actually allows um, them to know exactly what all their citizens are doing yeah. all the time. Uh, it was a bad surprise that China was able to create a firewall around its own country. I didn't actually think that was possible. I think now the way that some of these technologies are going, it's going to be increasingly hard for dictators to do that, uh, to prevent their citizens from accessing information in a way that allows them to make proper choices. And indeed, just to keep hold of all of the basic tools that a state has and needs to um, to control its citizens. 
Um, but but as but but, if, but your answer was specifically about us as Western intelligence operators. Uh, I think there will be a few intelligence services in the world of which mine will definitely be one <laughs> that have got the memo <laughs> and will adapt. And there will be a lot that don't and get destroyed. There's a great example of this when the Russians unwisely came to the UK to try to kill someone in Salisbury and used unaccountably a theatrical chemical weapon to do so. Was it an umbrella? Yeah. Um, no, this was um, this was poisoning a door handle with Novichok. Okay. Yeah, they do have form because they did do an umbrella earlier. You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I laugh now at how staggeringly naive they were about their capacity to keep that secret. You know, nonsense. They hadn't got the memo. <laughs> and I think the key thing for us is to constantly be learning, constantly understanding how the rules are changing and not crying about it, but adapting. And let's face it, our capacity to adapt, that is the thing that we have. That is a USP. Sir Alex Younger, former head of MI6, thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And this has been NatSec Tech from the Special Competitive Studies Project. I'm Jean Meserve. Thanks a lot for joining us.